no one is disagreeing that insulin resistance is horrible for you. My point is the opposite of that, which is also this detail that if you do not have insulin resistance, there is essentially no correlation between LDL and cardiovascular disease. Okay, that, that's a different argument. That's what I've been saying the whole time. <laughs> that's what I've been so, saying the but, whole time. But, that, but, but, you know, all of the studies that I quoted, and I'm sure you've read some of them, all of them show that, you know, the, the very few, you know, the, the percentage of people that were unfit or unhealthy or metabolically unhealthy were low, low amounts in those studies. And they showed that ApoB and, you know, LDL cholesterol, even at no, quote unquote normal levels, still had atherosclerosis developing. So even people were not obese, super lean, no insulin resistance, none of that still had atherosclerosis if their LDL cholesterols were even quote unquote normal. That's why we've lowered the normals to, to even lower now because we know more. So that would be the, the argument. I mean, you've got kids that are having atherosclerotic events, you know, before their teenage years with super high LDLs, you know, that's FH. we can they're talk about various, FH. that's different. I mean, it's not different. It's the same thing. These it's are people the same with no disease. FH is not I mean, the same thing. I'll tell you, well, we'll talk well, about I, FH in a moment, but I mean, let me go back to I, your point here, which sure. is that in those studies that you're mentioning, the, they're, they're not asking, I think that we're blind to insulin resistance. You're saying that in these studies, a small percentage of people have insulin resistance. But then you also told me that only 15 to 30% of the U.S. population has insulin resistance. And I'm showing you data that 90% of the U.S. population has suboptimal metabolic health, has some okay, degree of insulin a, resistance. I think you're confusing insulin resistance with like hypertension. No, I'm not obesity, because hypertension we know is essentially synonymous with insulin resistance. Those it's are not, connected. No, there, I have plenty of patients, I'm sure you do too, that that are have hypertension and obesity and are no and have like an A1C of 4.4. That doesn't I mean, mean there's wait, A1C is not a metric of insulin sensitivity. What is their fasting insulin? I I don't know, I haven't checked. Exactly, but still, you haven't checked. You, you, you don't know if how somebody's A one C if someone's A one C is four point four, it's highly unlikely that they have a fasting insulin of thirty or eighty or you know, fifteen or above four, whatever it is. I, I mean, disagree with you. Very unlikely. I disagree with you. So this is I think is where I mean, Western medicine is missing the boat. That out we are not and you said this, we are not checking fasting insulin on our patients. So we don't understand that there is I mean, a we have crisis. fasting glucose. But it's not as good as fasting insulin, right? Because it's can have, pretty close. It's not even close at all. No but you way. can't use fasting insulin without a fasting glucose. You have to relate the two. Oh, if somebody's you relate the two, but if somebody's seen, glucose is eighty, fasting glucose eighty, and their yeah. and their fasting insulin is like thirty, they have a problem. That's exactly. a different story. And that happens. We see people who have a fasting glucose of eighty and a fasting insulin of even ten or eleven. I would say that any fasting insulin above five micro IU per ml is too high. If you look at a Gaussian distribution of fasting insulin in the U.S. population, the average is nine. The average is nine. And so what we know is that if you look at these metrics, I would say that this is probably the most important point for us to try and communicate to each other. I know we're getting a little bit excited about this and kind of talking no, over I'm each not, other. No, I'm not getting excited at all. I mean, I mean that's fine. I'm telling you that, like, like you said, 90% of the people or whatever percentage that was have hypertension, have obesity, you know, all of that is corroborate you don't even need to study for that i mean just look at the cdc statistics super easy you don't even need to study it it's it's absolutely you know the vast majority of people have one of those things or all of those things or a combination and, and that's how most of those people end up being cardiac patients in addition to at least from my perspective that their apob was high and for the longest time we had such a high target for apob and we didn't lower it um but of course you know you can have you can i think you have a different view but without that apob being up there they wouldn't have heart attacks and strokes. They might have smoking, lung cancer, you know, obesity, hypertension, you. sleep apnea. That's, that's wrong. Okay. And I'll, I'll show you a study that, that, con that, that contradicts the point you just made. So here's sure. what we're saying. So there, there is something called Dunningen familial partial lipodystrophy. And I'll show you this study. And these people have a monogenic mutation at the LMNA gene. It's a single gene polymorphism. And they have insulin resistance and they do not have elevated ApoB, traditionally speaking. And they have massive, aggressive cardiovascular disease. So to say that people who have insulin resistance without elevated ApoB are not going to get cardiovascular disease is wrong. But circling back, because we see that it's a single gene on the nuclear envelope of a cell that changes and causes insulin resistance, profound insulin resistance. These people have lipodystrophy. They have abs, but they have visceral fat because they have insulin resistance due to their monogenic condition. They do not have elevated LDL and they have massive, aggressive atherosclerosis. So let's just and go you back. Also, 
No, but real quick, real quick, you also have people with hypobeta lipoproteinemia. These are people with like uh, no beta, you know, LDL particles, beta LDL, IDL. Um, they have no, they have almost no atherosclerosis. Depending on which gene is knocked out, you have no apoB. You have almost no atherosclerosis. So I of mean, course. we're probably talking about different populations with different things. Um, but either way, I mean, we can go back and forth on this, but maybe you had some other topics you wanted to discuss too. No, no, I have a lot of things. So let's just talk sure. about that for a moment. I want to get back to veins and arteries because we got off track, yeah. but I do want to talk about that as well. But I think it's just important that we understand that what you are describing, I think is, is one of the issues with Western medicine. And, and the reason that I think it's important we have this conversation, because if doctors see patients with hypertension, obesity, low HDL, high triglycerides, and an impaired or an impaired fasting glucose, and they don't consider those patients insulin resistant, we are failing our patients. All of those patients likely have some degree of insulin resistance and need a fasting insulin to be ordered. And so I think that we are blind to this epidemic of insulin resistance within our populations. And even the AHA, even the American Heart Association is blind to this. I have the same statistics that you have saying 10% of US adults have diabetes, 30, 15 to 30% have prediabetes. And I think, no, you're wrong. It's, it's 90% have prediabetes. We have an epidemic of insulin resistance. As those papers show repeatedly that very few people have optimal metabolic health. And I would define insulin resistance as a continuum. And if you do not have optimal metabolic health, you have some degree of insulin resistance. And my contention is that if you have some degree of insulin resistance, you are at a higher risk of atherosclerosis. Not because of your elevated ApoB, but because of the way those LDL particles, those ApoB particles are retained in the arterial wall. But that doesn't mean that ApoB or LDL causes atherosclerosis. To me, it indicates that we might be making an error of judgment and that LDL gets wrapped into atherosclerotic plaques that are happening more aggressively because people are not repairing the endothelium because they have some degree of insulin resistance. This gets back to this veins versus arteries thing, but I'll just talk about this for a moment. So, so when I, when I, I mean, look at... When I look at humans' art arteries and I look at the inside of an artery, we know that the inside of an artery and a vein are essentially endothelium. And we know that in all of us, because we have higher pressure in the arteries, we are getting some damage at the bifurcations due to turbulence. And so what I believe is happening, my hypothesis for what's happening in atherosclerosis, is not that LDL is driving endothelial damage. There's really no evidence that native LDL damages the endothelium. There's potentially evidence that oxidized LDL within the intimal space can damage the endothelium once the LDL has been oxidized by a macrophage. But there's really no good evidence that LDL is directly damaging to the endothelium. And as we'll see in our conversation about veins and arteries, we must have an endothelial injury to initiate atherosclerosis. That is the proximate event of atherosclerosis. And so what I think is happening here and the way that I think insulin resistance is related to all of this is that in people who have some degree of insulin resistance, they're not doing wound healing well. We know that at the extreme spectrum, Diabetics lose toes and they lose feet because of their impaired wound healing. We know that diabetics are increased risk of death from COVID. We know that obesity is a risk factor for COVID and all of these infectious diseases because their immune system doesn't work well. So my contention, my suspicion, my hypothesis here, the whole point of this discussion is to propose another theory of atherosclerosis that says, wait, what if LDL is not the right target? Because there's probably something else going on. What if endothelial damage is the originator of the atherosclerotic plaque? And it's only in people who are insulin resistant that that, uh, that atherosclerotic plaque begins to develop because that wound healing at the level of the endothelium is not proceeding properly. More of that LDL, more of that ApoB is retained in the proteoglycans in the subintimal space. That LDL is enriched in linoleic acid. I know we're going to get to that. Therefore, it's more likely to be oxidized and taken up by the macrophages and made into foam cells, made into these fatty streaks. But that's a very different position than saying LDL causes atherosclerosis because I don't believe LDL causes atherosclerosis. I believe insulin resistance predisposes us to impaired wound repair at the level of the endothelium, and that is what causes atherosclerosis. And that just like wood in a fire, LDL is involved in that and potentially necessary for that, but doesn't initiate it. This is the necessary but not sufficient idea. So when you see kids with a beta lipoproteinemia and they don't have very much LDL, and they don't have much atherosclerosis, I say, yeah. Well, a, a beta, you would die. <laughs> well, Hypo, right? Hypo. So they don't have much atherosclerosis. That means, okay, you have less wood, you have less fires. You know, if you have less of the material that gets wrapped into the plaque, less of the LDL that gets oxidized in the subintimal space, you're going to have less atherosclerosis. But to me, 
just intuitively and philosophically, I think it's an error of judgment to say that that means that LDL causes atherosclerosis. I said a lot there. Does that make sense? Can I clarify any of that? Because that was yeah. So a let good me just summary of the way that I think about things. And I want to. I still want to get to veins and arteries. No, I know we'll get to veins and arteries. But let me just tell you, I'm a I'm a preventative cardiologist. I'm also a weight loss doctor. I spend hours with each patient teaching them weight loss. I actually published multiple books on weight loss, how to lose weight properly without the you know madness that, that you read out there. But um, I even I even like become their friends on my fitness pal. I see what they're eating, what they're not doing. We add medications. Like I'm not telling people that it's okay to stay obese and we'll just treat your hypertension or sleep apnea with a machine or what, what have you. We try our hardest to get people to lose weight. I know sometimes people criticize Western medicine. They say, you guys just give us pills and you don't really try to do lifestyle. That, that's not true for me, at least. I don't know how it works with other people. I literally spend hours with each patient trying to get them to lose weight eat better, eat healthier, move more, what have you. We put them on meds if they need it to help lose weight, if they stall or what have you. So that is not me. I'm a bodybuilder. I'm a certified personal trainer. I teach my patients how to lose weight the correct way. Um, back back up a little bit there. I Metabolic health, I think the way you're defining it is, is a little bit different. Hypertension does not require insulin resistance. There are plenty of hypertensives, and we don't have to agree on it, but there are plenty of hypertensives, smokers, obese people that have no evidence of uh, high, uh, insulin resistance. I guess it depends on how you want to define it. But but either way, I agree that the vast majority of Americans, even if you want to go by the 73 or 83%, are overweight. No question about it. And that leads to a lot of things. Sleep apnea being one of the biggest ones, literally. Um, hypertension, even if, if they have the genes for diabetes, obviously diabetes, what have you, all of those things. Um, but ApoB, at the end of the day, if if it was not elevated, those people would not have that. Now, getting back to endothelial damage, in the 1970s, we used to have this thing where we thought it was a response to injury, where we thought that the endothelium was injured, kind of like what you were saying. The blood pressure caused shearing, the, you know, what have you, plaque formed, the cholesterol was the good guy coming to patch it up. We used to think that in the 1970s. We spent the next like 20 years trying to prove that either correct or not. You know, scientists are also have big egos and they want to prove each other right or wrong. Um, so they they they've done a lot of studies since then trying to figure out why on earth what happens. You know, do you need an injury? Do you need inflammation? Do you need to tear up the artery? And they've done the studies where they go in and actually damage the artery. It turns out it's not the places where the injury is, not the bifurcations. You know, and I've done cardiac caths on patients. The vast majority of lesions are not at bifurcations. And I'm sure you saw them when you were doing, you know, your thing um, with cardiology. They're straight lines. These arteries are straight lines and you see, you see the blockages. I mean, you know, this is like a heart model. You see the, the, these straight arteries, it's not always at a branch point. Um, and, and it wasn't that either. So they tested all these things for the next 20 years and they found out that the difference is they, first of all, you had to have intact endothelium that, that if you don't have intact, normal functioning endothelium, you cannot have atherosclerosis. They've gone in with catheters and scratched the endothelium and taken like ultrasound, IVUS ultrasound pictures of it. It, the 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 part that was damaged just scabbed over healed but next to it the fully intact normal part is the part that got the atherosclerosis so later in the 1995 1996 they published this new theory i don't know, I don't know if it's a theory it's probably proven at this point but they published this new thing <laughs> well maybe not but they published this new thing saying it's a response to retention that the difference is not um, damage. It's not the good guy coming in to plug up the damage. You actually need intact endothelium. The difference is that arteries, and this probably plays into the arteries versus veins, arteries can actually hang on or retain um, lipoproteins. And that was the actual difference. So like, even though these, there's so many of these, they're going in and out through the 70 nanometer, you know, gap junctions, even via transcytosis sometimes. Um, all these different ways that these things are getting into your arteries they get oxidized, they get damaged in there, the immune system macrophages, forms foam cells, and then you get this fibrous plaque. And then one day, you know, the, the, I think I, I, you know, I've showed the model here, you've got these plaque. And then one day a, a plaque ruptures, you've got, you know, a, a thrombus here, and then it plugs up your, your entire lumen. And that's how you have a heart attack. Now, not everybody has heart attacks. Um, but if you do, that's kind of the process. One of these fibrous, vulnerable, soft plaque ruptures, um, and that's what happens. Actually, calcified plaques generally are considered protective or not likely uh, to rupture. But it does mean when you have a calcium score that's positive that you also have tons of soft plaque that hasn't yet 
calcified, but it's the soft plaque that's going to cause, you know, about 80% of heart attacks, 70 to 80, depending on the, you know, paper you read, is what causes these acute MIs, the end stemmies and non stemmies and what have you. Um, so that's why, and, and veins and arteries are very different. Arteries are very thick and muscular. I mean, just look at like a cross section of what this looks like. This is um, very muscular, it has an endothelium, an intima, a media. Um, veins are like paper thin. They're, they're completely different. And when you take an artery we'll or a vein out of, out of the venous system and bypass it in cabbage, it arterializes. It actually gets thicker. It starts having atherosclerosis. It, it arterializes and it starts having the same problem um, that the uh, arterial side has. So I don't know if that uh, touches on some of the uh, things you were talking about, but that's kind of just my response to some of those things. 